And here now, the Old Testament reading from the book of Isaiah, covering the ideas of the suffering servant. Listen to God's word for you. Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases. Yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole, and by his bruises we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have all turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By a perversion of justice, he was taken away. Who could have imagined his future? For he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. They made his grave with the wicked and his tomb with the rich. Although he had done no violence, and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him with pain. When you make his life an offering for sin, he shall see his offspring and shall prolong his days. Through him, the will of the Lord shall prosper. Out of his anguish, he shall see the light. He shall find satisfaction through his knowledge. The righteous one, my servant, shall make many righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will allot him with a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the, with the strong." because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. And listen, too, to these words from the Gospel of Mark. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came forward to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What is it you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit one at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. But Jesus said to them, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They replied, we are able. Then Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. When the ten heard this, they began to be angry with James and John. So Jesus called them and said to them, You know that among the Gentiles, those whom they recognize as, as their rulers lord it over them, and their great ones are tyrants over them. 
but it is not so among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Good morning. Uh, I want to thank Pastor Harry for inviting me to be the guest preacher this morning. Uh, my wife Jan and I uh, moved to Santa Fe uh, two years ago, and we began uh, visiting First Presbyterian because our son Edward and daughter-in-law Ashley and grandson Oliver are members here in this church. Uh, in fact, I had the honor of baptizing uh, our grandson Oliver uh, almost two years ago. So uh, it's, uh, even though we're, we are relative newcomers to this congregation, uh, we definitely feel a warm connection here. So it's good to be with you this morning. Let's join together in prayer. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Almost from the beginning of life, a question, maybe the question, hovers over us. And the question is, are you able? Are you able to say please and thank you? Are you able to do well in your classes, make friends, earn a place on the team? Are you able to get into the college of your choice? Have a successful career, build a good marriage? Are you able to endure hardships, loss, and failure? Are you able to make a graceful transition from your work life to retirement? And on and on, this question reverberates until our dying breath. In truth, it's our response to this question that largely determines the character and shape of our lives. Well, in our scripture reading this morning, we heard Jesus raise this perennial question with his disciples. Are you able, he said, are you able to drink from the cup from which I drink and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? Well, to start, let's back up and recall what prompted Jesus to raise this question with his disciples. Today's scripture comes on the heels of Jesus' third announcement that he is to go to Jerusalem, where he will be rejected, suffer, and die. And only then will he rise again. Well, clearly, James and John don't quite hear that part about rejection, suffering, and death. Instead, they seize on the part about him rising again. They latch on to that traditional view of God's Messiah, that God's Messiah will come into Jerusalem in triumph, drive out the hated Romans, restore Israel, and inaugurate the glorious reign of God's kingdom. James and John, who along with Peter make up Jesus' inner circle, are simply lobbying for the top cabinet posts in Jesus' new administration. Grant us to sit, they ask, one at your left and one at your right when you come into your glory. Wow. Talk about not getting it. We might expect Jesus to say in response to James and John, have you been following me all this time and you're still clueless? Haven't you learned by now that ruling over others, dominating others, exercising authority over others 
is not the mission I am on. You knuckleheads. Well, if that's what Jesus was thinking, it's not what he said. In a surprisingly gentle rebuke, Jesus answers, you don't know what you're asking. And maybe we don't either. I mean, much like James and John, we are forever asking Jesus to fill our cup with whatever it is that we think we need or want. On I-25 between Santa Fe and Albuquerque, a billboard reads, are you anxious? Jesus is the answer. Depressed? Come to Jesus. Want to be wealthy, healthy, and wise? Just ask Jesus. A few years ago, a church growth consultant gave this advice to congregations. First, he said, find out where people itch, and then find ways to scratch that itch. The church, he said, is here to meet people's needs. Now, the church does need to respond to the concerns of people. But as long as our discipleship is stuck on what we want rather than on what Jesus commands, then we are right back in the company of James and John. And what Jesus said to them, perhaps he says to us as well, you don't know what you're asking. And it, it's then that Jesus turns our attention from what we think we need or, or want to the challenge of following him in a life of service. He asks, are you able to drink the cup from which I drink? Be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? Of course, the cup that Jesus drinks is filled to overflowing with God's compassion, and not just for some, but for all. Jesus' baptism is his immersion into the world's travail. Why? Because that's where God is. The Son of Man has come, Jesus tells the disciples, not to be served, but to serve. Jesus is the man of sorrows, the suffering servant who gives himself for the healing of the whole world. Are you able to drink from this cup, he asks, and be baptized with such a baptism? Well, yes, absolutely, exclaim James and John. We're all in. You can depend on us. You can almost hear James and John lifting up their voices and belting out that old church hymn. Are you able, said the master, to be crucified with me? Yea, the sturdy dreamers answered, to the death will follow thee. It reminds us of Peter boasting, Lord, I will never betray you. Lead on, we are able. But to be honest, I'm not so sure that I am able. And you may not be either. I remember a, a story about Clarence Jordan, who was the founder of the interracial cooperative called Cornania Farms in South Georgia. Clarence's brother, Robert, was a prominent lawyer in Georgia, became a state senator and later a justice on the state Supreme Court. Of course, not everybody in Georgia was happy about Clarence Jordan's efforts to promote economic and racial justice. And at one point, the legal challenges became so severe that Clarence called on his brother, Robert, for legal assistance. Robert declined, saying, Clarence, I just can't do that. It would jeopardize my political aspirations. If I represented you, I could lose everything. 
To which Clarence responded, well, Robert, we could lose everything too. Yes, said Robert, but Clarence, it's different for you. Well, Clarence wanted to know just how is it different, Robert? As I recall, we both joined the church the same Sunday as boys. We both got dunked into the waters of baptism. The preacher asked me the same question he asked you. He, he said, is Jesus your Lord and Savior? And I said, yes, Robert. What did you say? <laughs> to which Robert responded, oh, come on, Clarence. I follow Jesus up to a point. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I have some sympathy for Robert. Like many of us, I'm willing to drink the cup from which Jesus drinks, but maybe up to a point. Certainly when it comes to the hurts and the needs of those closest to us, our family and friends, we are able to share in their sufferings. We feel their pain and we're willing to do whatever it takes to help them. But the cup of which Jesus drank is so much larger than our inner circle. It's filled with God's compassion for the desperate, desperate asylum seekers crowding our borders, for the suffering masses in Afghanistan, Mozambique, Ethiopia, and so many other places, including on the street corners of our own city. If you're like, like me, it may be with some reluctance that you turn on the evening news because the human and environmental tragedies throughout the world are just so overwhelming. A recent online article gave a name to this experience. It called it second-hand sadness. That is, you know, while we ourselves may be mostly unscathed by the suffering in the world, it still gets to us. And it makes us feel anxious and helpless. You know, how in God's name can anyone drink from such a bitter cup without giving up in despair. Yet let's don't be discouraged. After all, no one of us is required, nor are we able to drink the whole cup. We are only asked to drink that portion that is our share, knowing that we don't drink alone. You know, if you or I were directly responsible for every ill, called upon to address every injustice or attack every evil, we would be crushed under the burden, for suffering is everywhere in this hard world. I'm helped in this regard by the Quaker Thomas R. Kelly in his classic book called A Testament of Devotion. He reminds us that while we should look with tender compassion on suffering everywhere, we are only called to a few central tasks. Each person, indeed each congregation, has to discern what is our particular portion. We can't eliminate world hunger but we can, as some of you in the congregation are doing, serve meals at Pete's place. We can't heal the environment, but we can each one take specific actions. As Thomas Kelly writes, we cannot die on every cross, nor are we expected to. It's liberating to recall that we all drink from the same cup. But each of us drinks only that portion that is assigned to us. And here's some more encouraging news. It appears that Jesus simply overlooks the miscues, the misgivings, and the misunderstandings of his disciples. And he says emphatically, you will drink from the cup from which I drink and you will be baptized 
with my baptism. Perhaps what we are not able to do ourselves, God is able to do for us and through us if we open our eyes and hearts to God's unbounded compassion. Ultimately, it's not our ability that counts the most, but rather the steady presence of Christ's Spirit that enables us to faithfully follow Jesus without giving up hope. So friends, let's face it. The cup which Jesus drinks is a bitter cup because it contains every tear that falls, every anguished cry for help, for food, for peace, for justice. But paradoxically, Christ's cup is also brimming with joy and overflowing with love. It fills us with what St. John of the Cross calls a luminous darkness, or what Richard Rohr describes as a bright sadness. That is to say, Christ's cup contains both deep suffering and intense joy. It is, in short, the cup of salvation for the healing of the world. Are you able, said the master, Yes, Lord, with your help, we are able. Thanks be to God.